This video will demonstrate a systematic approach to examining the hip joint. It will also give examples of pathology which may be found in examination of an abnormal hip. The hip joint is the ball and socket joint. It is rarely involved in extrinsic trauma but is often affected by intrinsic trauma, frequently fracture of the neck or femur. Chronic conditions such as osteoarthritis also commonly affect the hip joint. Pathology in the hip can present with pain referred to the knee, whilst the hip itself can be the site of pain referred from the spine. Examination of the hip joint uses a look-feel-move system designed by Apley. This system ensures that all parts of the joint are thoroughly examined and pathology is not missed. As with any examination, wash your hands, introduce yourself, correctly identify your patient, gain consent and ask about pain. First of all, ensure adequate exposure. Ideally, one joint above and below should be exposed. With the patient standing, look at the anterior, lateral and posterior aspect of each hip joint. When looking at the skin, there may be erythema overlying an inflamed hip joint. Scars from previous surgery may be present. These could be from the anterior, lateral and posterior ports of a hip arthroscopy or a scar on the lateral or posterior aspect of the joint from a hip replacement. When looking at the soft tissue, there may be wasting of the gluteal muscles. This can occur if the superior gluteal nerve is damaged during hip surgery. It is difficult to see any of the bony structures of the hip, as the joint is deeply buried under muscle. An increased lumbar lordosis may indicate a fixed flexion deformity of the hip, commonly due to osteoarthritis of the hip. Check whether the patient uses any walking aids. Ask the patient to walk and look at their gait. One example of an abnormal gait is the Trendelenburg gait. This is the waddling gait, where the patient's body sways sideways, to and fro, when viewed from the front. This is due to weakness of the hip abductor muscles, forcing the patient to use their trunk muscles instead, to lift the pelvis high enough to swing the leg through. If the hip joint is painful, the patient may display an antalgic gait, with a short stance phase on the affected side. Weakness of the hip abductors can be demonstrated using the Trendelenburg test. Ask the patient to stand on both legs facing you and to place their palms on top of your palms. The patient is asked to stand first on one leg and then on the other leg. The test is positive if when the patient tries to stand on the affected leg, the examiner feels a firm push downwards from the patient's hand on the contralateral side. A positive test implies dysfunction or weakness of the hip abductor on the affected side and may be due to chronic hip pain, iatrogenic injury or childhood diseases such as developmental dysplasia of the hip. Ask the patient to lie down on the couch and look for a leg length discrepancy. This can be done by placing both legs together in the same extended position and ensuring that the anterior superior iliac spines are level with each other. If there appears to be a discrepancy in length between the two legs, this discrepancy may be true or apparent. A true leg length discrepancy is caused by bones in the two limbs being of unequal length, for example after a fracture. To measure only a true leg length dis discrepancy, each leg is measured from the anterior superior iliac spine or asis to the medial malleolus. To determine which bone is responsible for the shortening, both knees should be bent up to a right angle. The knees should then be looked at from the side. If the femur is short on the shorter leg lies lower, then the shortening is below the knee. If the tibia on the shorter leg lies further back than the other leg, the shortening is above the knee. An apparent leg length discrepancy is caused by joint deformity, for example a fixed flexion deformity. This is determined by measuring from the xiphi sternum to the medial malleolus of each leg. This slide summarises the key abnormalities you should look for during examination of the hip. It is important to check the neurovascular status of each leg. Test distal sensation, feel for peripheral pulses and check capillary refill time. Most of the bony structures of the hip joint are deep and difficult to feel. It is however important to feel over the greater trochanter 
on the lateral side of the hip. Tenderness at this point indicates greater trochanteric bursitis. This slide summarises what should be felt during examination of the hip. In the hip, the active and passive movement of flexion and extension are best combined in the modified Thomas's test. The patient is lying in a supine position. Place one hand under the lumbar spine and then ask the patient to actively bring up both knees to their chest. Watching the patient's face, passively push each hip into further flexion. The flexion of the two hips can then be compared. The normal range is 130 degrees. The patient is now asked to hold the affected hip flexed by locking their hands around the shin. The other leg is now carefully extended as far as comfortable. Pressure should continue to be felt on the examiner's hand under the back and the hip should be able to extend fully so that the leg lies flat on the couch. The normal leg is then flexed back up again as far as possible and held there by the patient. The abnormal hip is now allowed to extend, carefully watching the patient's face until it will no longer extend any further. If the pressure on the examiner's hand under the back lessens, this suggests that the patient has a fixed flexion deformity and is compensating by lifting the pelvis in order to extend the leg. The angle the femur makes to the couch in full extension should be noted. Rotation of the hip is always limited in the extremes of flexion and extension due to tightening of the capsule. It is therefore important to test rotation of the hip in mid-range by flexing the hip and knee to 90 degrees. The tibia can then be used as a lever to test internal and external rotation, watching the patient's face and comparing the two sides. Be aware that external rotation of the hip is tested when the foot is moved across the body and should normally be about 45 degrees. Internal rotation of the hip is tested when the foot is brought out to the side and should also be about 45 degrees. Reduced internal rotation is an early sign in osteoarthritis. In order to test abduction, place your forearm across the patient's pelvis with the tips of your fingers resting on one asis and your forearm resting on the other closest to you. Abduct and adduct each hip and note the angle when you feel the pelvis starting to move under your hands. Normal range of abduction is 45 degrees, whilst adduction is 30 degrees. Special additional tests include FABER and FADIR. FABER is an acronym which stands for the position of the hip during the test. Flexion, abduction and external rotation. Place the ankle above the contralateral knee. Stabilise the asis on the other side and push down gently on the knee. Reproduction of hip pain and restriction of movement indicates intraarticular pathology such as osteoarthritis, while sacroiliac pain may suggest sacroiliac joint dysfunction. The FADIR test involves placing the hip in flexion, adduction and internal rotation. Reproduction of anterolateral hip pain during the FADIR test is a sensitive indicator of femoracetabular impingement. This slide summarises the normal range of movement at the hip joint and special tests which may be performed. The key points to remember when examining the hip are to first look at the joint with the patient standing, walking and lying down. Examine the neurovascular status of both limbs and feel over the greater trochanter. Determine the range of movement at the joint. Always remember to compare one side with the other and watch the patient's face to avoid causing further pain. To complete examination of the hip, the lumbar spine and knee should also be examined. If pathology is detected, appropriate imaging should be requested.